the bolt in all thanks to our friendly team at Palmer Bed, of course. And, uh, well, uh, surely they've got the red carpet out of Copenhagen for this man, Shane Anderson, as we welcome you, mate. Uh, what a tipping performance last weekend. You're on fire, big fella. Uh, Matty, good to be with you as well as you, Adam. Yeah, it was uh, good to see a few things fell our way last weekend. Uh, and the Everest in particular, we think about it holding off uh, I Wish I Win. But uh, as we've said numerous times throughout this uh, coverage over the, the, the Spring Carnival, there's just been so many highlights. But that Everest was a, a terrific race, terrific contest. It probably made up for uh, those of us that were with the favourite, the Caulfield Guineas, where everything went wrong with militarised. But uh, we'll, take the, we'll take the win in the big one. Yeah, absolutely. And Adam McGrath, we say good afternoon to you, mate. Oh, it's night time over in Vegas. It never stops over there, big fella. No, night time. We know it's when they do their best work over here. Hopefully we'll be doing the same with this uh, <laughs> podcast and finding some more winners. Because as you said, uh, Shana was on absolute fire last week. Had a couple of uh, runner-up performances to him. But geez, it was a good weekend of racing. Yeah, it was a cracker. And let's go back to the Everest boys. I think it overtakes it out. From I wish I win, Shane, you're all over both of them, mate. Um, do you reckon Barrier 1... Was the knock, if, if, the, if there was a different barrier, do you think it would have been a different result or same result? Uh, look, I, I tend to go down the, the, the path of, I think it was going to be the same result. Look, at the end of the yeah. day, uh, I wish I win, got out in plenty of time to finish over the top, of, I thought, yeah. think about it. Uh, he was there to win the race. He couldn't get, he couldn't do it. Think about it. He's a very, very tough, um, outstanding sprinter and he just mapped perfectly in the run. He was in the right spot at the right time. He presented there to win the race at the top of the straight. He asserted when he needed to and then he kicked and, and held his rivals off. So I, I tend to be in the camp that I think we got the right result. That's no knock on I wish I win um, because his racing pattern is pretty much to be back and finishing off. So in sprint races, particularly in the elite level, it's a different level of pressure, all of those sort of things. It's not always going to pan out that he'll just naturally finish over the top of his rivals. He's run out of his skin. But I think we've got the right winner. His overall record is astonishing. He's only ever beaten once, and it was a bit of a head-scratcher of a ride that day when he was beaten, think about it. So he's proven himself to be, if not the number one sprinter in the country, right up there in every conversation. His record is amazing. All credit to Joe Pride and big pat on the back to Sam Clipperton, who I thought just rode him superbly. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, adds a uh, really impressive victory. Great race horse. Great race, as Shane touched on before. It's just building momentum, isn't it, the Everest? I, I must admit, I, I love it. I love the concept. I, I love the fact that uh, the crowd get into it before the race. There was another 40,000 or 45,000 there in the weekend. It's certainly building, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, uh, talking to people here in America, they're obviously watching the coverage that we had. Um, I mean, when you see 40, 50,000 people singing Sweet Caroline two minutes before, you don't get that anywhere in the world. That's uh, absolutely unbelievable. But you have to love this game, don't you? I mean, we're doing the same podcast. We're watching the same race. Shane believes we had the best winner. I think I was absolutely robbed, and I wish I win sort of bolted in. I think <laughs> put up the straight, doesn't get out to late, finally comes, necks out, three more strides, it wins. So uh, that's why we love this game, because I thought I wish I win was clearly the best horse in the run. Thought it was very unlucky and thought Barrier 1 undid it, as we sort of mentioned in the preview. But take nothing away from the winner, as Shane said. And Shane's identified this horse really early. I had a few question marks on this guy up in Queensland. Shane, you were really confident on it, but he just seems to get better with better horses. So I look forward to seeing how these challenges keep going because he puts himself uh, you know, in a great position, which was the difference, I think. Sam Clipperton, uh, as we mentioned, rides him so well. And Joseph Pride, he deserves a lot of credit to have first and third in that race and some of the owners having both horses as well. I can imagine it was a really big weekend, but he's put a lot of hard work in and uh, he's certainly getting that credit for being a very handy sprint trainer. Can I just throw in a quick point to that, Adam? And look, yeah, I mean, I like the niggle there with Obisha he, he, he To your eye, yes, he was very unlucky. But let me just say one thing about think about it. I remember saying quite a while back on social media when I try and be my provocative best, uh, he reminded me a lot. I think I said it on this show. He, like, he reminded me a lot in the early days of Takeover Target. Now, Takeover Target was, a, in a way, a charge and barge type of sprinter. He used to go to the front and try and run his rivals ragged. The what the angle that I was taking though, he was a slow maturing sprinter in that you could just see that every time he went onto the racetrack, more development would come, more development would come. And when he got to the big stage, he'd do the job and then he'd get better again and so on. And I think that's potentially what we'll see we think about it is that he will keep developing. And I think he's going to be right at the top of the tree now for a couple of seasons ahead. He is a really, really exciting horse and he's got that ability to stretch out a bit further and trip if they choose to go down that path. So, 
Yeah, great, great uh, horse, great race. One other point I just want to throw in, Matty. Um, Josh Blanksby, who's the CEO of the Melbourne Racing Club, a great mate of mine, um, he put out uh, a tweet that $105 million was wagered on the Caulfield Guineas wow. meet um, last weekend. What at the point I'm taking, now we haven't seen the figures being released from Racing New South Wales or the ATC, but you would say at a bare minimum, it would be that same amount, likely a bit more. That means we've got a meeting or a day of racing where over 200 million domestically, at a minimum, is being bet on two major meetings in the country. Amazing. Huge success story for the way that they've brought these uh, these cards together, the Everest and the Caulfield Guineas, all credit to the administrators for aligning. And hopefully we'll see more of that to come. Yeah, well said, mate. Absolutely. What about uh, Fangirl knocking over the champ? Mr. Brightside, I don't think we've seen this coming, did we? Add, uh, we kind of called the best 1,600 horse virtually the world last week. And, uh, yeah, all credit to Fangirl. And Chris Wall's got this horse absolutely flying. Yeah, well, Shane and I sort of talked about uh, that we cannot catch this horse. And, again, we were proven right. <laughs> we say, let's stay with it. He does nothing wrong. He's the best miler in the country. And, of course, he goes down. So that was uh, bound to happen. But, look, Fangirl's always had this. We've, we've always talked about it. Sometimes she's been a victim of tracks. She's been a, a, a victim of barriers. But coming into this preparation, it just seems like, again, we just talked about, think about it clicking. It looks like it started to click with her. She's turned into a proper racehorse. She's matured now. She's tough. She can have a hard run and go through it. And I think the confidence that uh, J-Mac has shown with her in previous uh, editions as well, I think she's uh, ready to really take that next step as well. So it was a serious performance. I mean, she gapped him, really. It was, uh, even though Mr. Brightside was coming late, it was never really going to be a question or a tight race at all. So to win over that type of a field, you know, Kovalika, we think sort of potential, well, we know it's a group one horse and it's got more group ones probably in it. We've seen Think It Over go against these plenty of times. Hope in your hearts, no uh, mug either. So she's beaten a really good field carrying 57 kilos as well. So I think they'd be very excited about that performance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great, great. Just on that, just want to throw in one Point if I can, Matty, uh, with Fangirl, uh, you know, she's won the Winx. She's now come out and won the King Charles the third, And I think Chris Waller is quite keen to have a crack at the Cox Plate with her now. Yep. Uh, she's going to have a spin at uh, the Valley at uh, Breakfast with the Best or whatever they call it now, the, the big track work gallop session that they do on the Tuesday morning. If she gallops and handles the Valley well, she'll take her place in the Cox Plate. And she's a worthy runner because she's in peak form and she's had a great season so far. Yeah, he's done a great job. That is for sure. What about uh, Griff uh, and the Kiramar? David Eustace Juggernaut continues to roll on. Benny Mellum, of course, all shifts out. Um, you know, what did you make of the Caulfield Guineas? It was a real blowout, boys, wasn't it? I'll come back to you, Shane Oak. Yeah, good. Well done to Ma and Eustace. We talk about them a lot as being a dominant force in Australian racing. They just Every time they start a horse in a, in a big race, they tend to run well. I couldn't find him. He was a big price. Benny Mellon gave him every hope. And he wobbled over the, the concluding stages to you know, cause a little bit of uh, interference to V8, who ran well in second. Look, to my mind, the winner is always going to be known now as a Caulfield Guineas winner. The best run of the race clearly was militarised. Blowout way too far back in a race that didn't pan out. His last 200 was quite outstanding. And through the line, he was really humming. So militarise, yep, for those of us who took the shorts, he was beaten in a Caulfield Guineas. He's legitimately top class. If they press on to the Cox Plate, which is looking likely, uh, I think he's going to be right in the thick of things. So I hate not talking and giving huge amounts of credit to a winner of a Caulfield Guineas in Griff, but I don't have much more to say about him. He's a nice horse. Uh, I don't know which direction they're going to go with him, but the one that really, really caught my eye was militarised. Desperately unlucky. And he's proven to me that he's a legitimate top class horse. Hey, what would you make of Stepati, Ads? Look, I thought it was good. I mean, firstly, I would say that I think the top five, you would have picked four of the five. We know V8 was in there, Step Party, King Colorado, Militarized. Yeah. So the, the good runners were right there as well. I wouldn't have found Griff. And um, Shane said, well, we'll tell you what, it was moving sideways at a fast rate, wasn't it? Uh, very, uh, very late in that race. But I thought Step Party was really good. I think all of them behind were good. V8 could have got very close had that horse not come across it. King Colorado ran well and Militarized, as Shane said, was the run of the race. So... For mine, it was just a very good addition uh, of the Caulfield Guineas. And well done to Kieran Murray and Dave Eustace. As Shane said, we do talk about them. And even in this event, they had four runners and all four have finished in the top 10. So they just continue to uh, dominate these type of events. And talking about uh, congratulations, uh, what about uh, attrition upsetting Amelia's Jewel? Uh, and Mitchie Freeman, Bo Mertens uh, both get their first Group 1 victories. 
A great story. Uh, I sent little Bowie a message on uh, Sunday morning and he was absolutely over the moon. You know, the old man saying that he would have been looking down at him proud as punch. And, and Mitch Friedman, uh, who I've had a little bit to do with over the journey as well. Great story, Mitch. He's always had horses that are knocking on the door. Um, can't quite kind of, you know, couldn't quite get that group one victory, but uh, attrition, well done. And Colin and Janice McKenna, of course, who incidentally flew up to Sydney for light infantry uh, and weren't actually in Melbourne. So it's just funny sometimes they're racing works boys certainly is this was my this probably summarized my entire day race 10 i think you remember i said going into it, it's a flip of the coin between pinstripe and attrition for the value bet i only backed pinstripe didn't even look at attrition in the end said <laughs> no i'm just going to stay with the best bet and the value bet and of course attrition comes out but as you mentioned uh, i always love seeing new people win uh group one so well done to bowie moons and mitch freeman and Mitch was doing what, uh, what you were doing, Matty. He went for a run the next day as well, so I don't even think he uh, celebrated it. He completed his first half Ironman or half marathon, I think I saw on social media. So it was a busy weekend for him, but good animal. Look, it was disappointing the run before, but the start before that, as I said, it was with, with pinstripes and also with Mr. Brightside. So the riding had been on the wall. You just had to forgive that disappointing run, and they uh, did well to get it up again for the two rack and win impressively. And Amelia's jewel, Shane, we've, we've talked about it. I think this is a blessing in the skies. I know that's a horrible thing to say. You never want to see a horse got no, uh, not go well. And um, from all reports, she hasn't eaten up since. So that's the aim at the moment is to ensure that she gets good. They've done the blood tests and they're just going to try and um, make sure she's well. But the Cox Plate's now out and now maybe they look to go to Sydney, which is where we've been saying we think she'll do her best work. So I'm hoping we see that fast improvement and maybe we can still see her in the big one out there because I still think that's her race and that's where she'll give it a shake. I don't think she was going to be the Cox Plate threat. This is the one I think she should have been going to from day one. Yeah, I think it was, uh, you summed it up well. I mean, just on face value, it was just a really below par performance. And she didn't look like the Amelia's Jewel that we saw in her two previous starts. I know that um, you know, there's been plenty of dissection post race, particularly about her overall peak performance ratings by um, some really, really impressive ratings um, analysts, uh, you know, Dan O'Sullivan in particular, you know, talking through where she kind of fits into the overall equation. So I think it, whatever way you want to look at it, it wasn't the real Amelia's Jewel last weekend. Uh, I hope she can bounce back. High quality mare, super popular, great for the sport. Uh, but to Mitchell Freeman, Bo Mertens, it was one of the, the great pleasures of last weekend seeing them get their breakthrough uh, success at Group 1 level. Two terrific guys, great talents, and next generation of, of top class uh, sports people as a trainer and a jockey coming through. Another one you're all over last week, mate, of course, Alligator Blood, Gay Waterhouse, Adrian Bott. They are airborne at the moment, and so is this horse. Uh, magnificent training performance and uh, just blew them away, to be honest, Shano. And, uh, wow, you just kept rolling on, mate. Uh, sure, <laughs> a bucket load of cash over there in Copenhagen, hidden in the backyard somewhere after the weekend. Yeah, we do get hit with very high tax rates over here, Matty. Um, <laughs> no, the, the the thing about Alligator Blood that I love is that season after season after season, he just keeps coming back and yeah. measuring up. Um, he's just tough, honest, reliable, enjoyable to watch. You know, and when you bet on him, uh, you know that you're going to be right in the firing line because his natural style is put himself on pace or lead. He's right up there. And if the brakes go his way and they don't go too fast, he's he's going to be usually in front. Like, he's just a really good horse. Seven group ones, ridiculous amounts of prize money. He's a mess now. Uh, I love him. Um, now, again, next step, Cox Plate. Do I want to be in a Cox Plate? I think it'll all come down to where he draws in the race and what type of run that, that leaves him up with. But good to see him win another group one this campaign. To me, the disappointing angle of the race was how badly just fine the Metropolitan winner ran. Uh, he was very, very flat um, with the, the ease back in trip after the, the win at 2,400 metres, and it was a gut buster win. Yeah. So, you know, him pressing onto a Melbourne Cup now, I think, question marks with that. He's going to have to, you know, really bounce back in a big way. He was very, very flat. Shane, where did you rate that alligator blood win? Because, uh, again, you tipped it, you liked it. I said the concern was 2,000 metres, hadn't finished in the top three from two runs, but he didn't get it his own way this time. I and mean, Deny Knowledge went quick out in front. He was the horse carting up the field. So, if anything, he I thought he was there to be vulnerable. So, for mine, that was one of his strongest performances, and it's probably the first time now I go, all right, I've, I've got to reassess again now. Um, how, how did you see it? Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, but when I look back at these two defeats at 2,000 metres previously, uh, one of them was in the Caulfield Stakes or the Biden Power Stakes, as it's now known, 12 months ago, where he was in the wrong part of the track and he was beaten by the best of the, the, the crop that we have in Australia in that distance range very narrowly. I think it was less than two lengths. 
and his other run was in a Cox Plate, where again he wasn't beaten too far in a race where he there was an enormous amount of pressure. Um, I don't think he's gone better. Like he's going better than what he was twelve months ago. I think he's holding a level. I just think in in many ways, Adam, that perhaps the depth of the field he was up against in the call in the Martin Power Stakes, going to get the the name of the race right these days. Uh, I just think it was probably a weaker edition of that race than what we've seen perhaps historically. Um, and there's a lot of discussion going on with the you know the way that the programs changed. Are we getting the the, the big proper strength group ones when there are so many opportunities for, for top class horses now to earn big prize money. So to me, it was probably a weaker might and power than what we've seen over the years. Gave him his chance and he really dominated that race. So that's the way I'm looking at it. Um, but he hasn't gone backwards. I think he's just really holding a level. And pushes onto a, a, a Cox Plate in a couple of weeks' time, which is so exciting as well. Uh, Asfura versus Uncommon James. Uh, Shana, you're all over it. Ads, you're in the Uncommon James camp. I must admit, I was in the Asfura camp, mate. Uh, I reckon she's an absolute star. She proved it. Same thing. I thought, you know, they, they took it to her. You know, like they kind of, they both uh, ran along and uh, she just showed. Uh, and that was coming off the back of that really... Uh, strong run against Imperatries at Dutta Valley a couple of weeks ago. A bit of a gut buster. Um, she's a good horse, isn't she? Yeah, I jumped shift. You know, I was with Asura that day, and I just thought when watching that replay, you could see that Uncommon James lost that a bit around the bend and picked up, but the blinkers didn't work. I saw an article already this week on Racing.com, Training Partnership said, nope, they'll be coming straight back off for Uncommon James. So they learned from that, but I don't think even with out the blinkers, they would have been able to beat Asura from that performance because that was a better performance than we've seen in recent times as well. I think she really put her hand up again and said, don't forget about me for some of these races. Again, we talk about different people. Henry Dwyer is one of the goods going around. Mitchell Aiken has struggled with his weight. He's gone to South Australia. He's come back to Victoria. He's had his battles as well. So well done to those connections. But she's a serious horse and she'll be making her presence felt in any single race that she goes in uh, this spring as well. Yeah, he's uh, trained her perfectly, uh, Henry. Uh, the only, you know, time she really looked somewhat vulnerable was in that race with the Peritrees, where who sort of rushed past her late. And I think that just again enhances the depth of that form. I really like her at a thousand to eleven hundred meters. I'm not sure I want a Svira at twelve hundred meters in some of the Group One races, but thousand and eleven hundred meters, bang on the money. Uh, she's just a terrific mare, and well done to Henry and the team. They've uh, done a great job with her. Right, and let's turn our attention to the one and only Group 1 this weekend, Caulfield Cup. It is over the 2,400 metres in the market, all thanks to Palmer Bet Gold Trip. Been a lot of conjecture during the week as to uh, which way this horse was going to go. Um, but uh, Gold Trip is our favourite at 5 bucks. Our equal favourite was Sulcum at $5. Without a fight at $6. West Wind Blows at 6 bucks. Break Up, the Japanese Raider at 9 bucks. Monophilia at 11 bucks. Francesca Gardi at $13. And who you mail at fourteen dollars? I'm going to start with you, Adam McGrath. What's your thoughts on the 2023 Caulfield Cup? My thoughts were: there's no way in the world I was going to jump off Gold Trip after saluting for us at thirty dollars last start, Matty. <laughs> but I'm going to because, and I'm again interested to see Shane's thoughts. Uh, for mine, this has got Romantic Warrior vibes all about it again. If you're making a decision Wednesday going into a race Saturday. That's not the confidence levels I want. That's not the prep I want. I want to know that this has been our plan. This is how we're building. This is our strategy and off we go. Benny Mellum hops on. Benny Mellum's riding's good. He got a group one as well, but there's just too much change here for my liking. So I've ended up going against Gold Trip. If he comes out and blows him away, it'd be no surprise. I think he's going better than he ever has. I think that's been shown so far by his two runs, but I just can't back it having seen those changes and those decisions as well. So I am going uh, without a fight. This horse has never let me down so far. Two from two. I like that Zara's on it. We just know what he's going to produce at this time of the year. Drops from 59 kilos down to 55. So I think that's a really big positive. Up the 600 metres, ran the fastest six to four and two to finish in that race as well. And Zara basically sat up if you have a look at those last three, four strides as well. Um, we often talk about good trials. I mean, that was one of the better trials I've seen for a Caulfield Cup going to the Underwood Stakes. So I'm going to go without a fight. I think he can get the job done. And then my value bet, I found this quite difficult. I've gone back to non-conformist here. Um, second in this race back in 2021, just didn't come up this time last year. 59 kilos so far this prep. We've seen it beaten 2.4 in the Underwood, six in the mind power. I didn't think the race was the run was that bad. Drops to 53 and a half, ran the fastest of fourth, uh, ran the fourth fastest last 200 in the Underwood, third fastest last 200 last start. And the last time this horse didn't carry 59, it won the group two blamey. So it's going to really appreciate just not carrying that top weight again. So I think he can run a nice little sort of race. I think that 2400 will really suit. You just know what you're going to get with non conformists. He's pretty honest. 
Beautiful. Shano, what are your thoughts, mate? A uh, wide open, really tough Caulfield Cup this year. I think the market suggests that the way it's structured. You know, you've got uh, two at $5, two at $6, one at $9 and $11 the field. So it's, I think the market's suggesting it's a hard one to work out. I've changed my mind numerous times, but getting towards the death, I've landed on my best being number eight, Sulkin. Uh, Craig Williams taking the ride for Chris Waller with 53 and a half kilos on his back. You go through his form, terrific first up and winning the heavily with 58 and a half kilos. He progressed to the underwood. He ran really well, wait for age, finishing fourth behind Alligator Blood, 59 kilos on his back, as you'd expect for wait for age there. He went to the Turnbull. He's run third, finishing the race off well, 56. And he's now dropping down in weight again. Uh, Walla, the master trainer, knows how to win these big races, mapping out a program superbly. And I love the fact Craig Williams is riding. And he's riding in great confidence, Craig, after the little bit of drama at the start of the, the spring um, with the giga kick um, fiasco, for want of a better term. But Craig's got his blinkers on. He's focused. He knows how to win a Caulfield Cup. And I just think Solcombe, you know, as I said, I've chopped and changed, but I've come back to him. And I'm now, as we're getting close to the race, becoming more confident that he's the right horse to be with. So I've got Who are you chopping and changing with, Shane? Yeah, well, I'm, I think uh, the one that was always causing me a bit of trouble was West Wind Blows uh, mm. because I like him a lot. I thought he ran really well in the Turnbull Stakes. Um, you know, uh, I just, I don't have much between the pair. Um, I just I don't want to be derogatory towards Jamie Spencer at all because he's a superstar jockey. He's won Group 1s in Australia. He's had phenomenal record in in uh, in Europe. Think about Jamie. He likes to ride very, very quiet. Um, you know, he's, he's well known. You'll see if you get on YouTube and, and you just see some of the Jamie Spencer rides, he's always sitting out the back and just letting a horse work into a race, work into a race, work into a race. And then only really asking for an effort late in the piece. He's not a really aggressive physical rider. Caulfield Cups can often be aggressive physical races, you know, particularly as they charge out of the straight the first time. So, again, I'm a huge fan of Jamie Spencer, but I just have concerns where West Wind Blows will settle in the run and he might just be left with a little bit too much to do over the concluding stages. Um, but I like him a lot. So, chopped and changed. That were the, the two principal ones. I looked at Break Up, the Japanese horse. Like, he's run well in some big races in Japan, including winning a Group 2, but his price has always been massive in those races, so he kind of outruns his price a lot. Yeah. So I'm not really sold on him. Um, uh, Solcom, I don't want to talk myself out of it. I'm confident he'll, he'll run bad. really well. He's, he's the one I want to be. There's two the value runners. I'm putting in two as the value runners, and they're the Joseph O'Brien runners in Akita Sushi and Valiant King. Akita Sushi, I've backed uh, a few times uh, through his career in Europe and had a good result with him at Royal Ascot when he won a big handicap race. Down in the weights, he's dangerous. He's got actually a really, really strong... Um, uh, the turn of foot and acceleration at the end of his races. So down in that weight, he's really dangerous. And Valiant King ran really well in a couple of races, including Royal Ascot. He was runner up to Vorban in a race in Ireland before, you know, a slightly below par run of his most recent, but it wasn't bad. I just, with him only 50 kilos on his back and Jamie Carr, I think he's very dangerous. So my best for the Caulfield Cup, Sulkin, two value bets, Akita Sushi and Valiant King. But it's a wide open race this year. It's one of the, the toughest Caulfield Cups uh, I've looked at for, for quite quite a many years. I can't believe not one of you uh, tip gold trip either. It's uh, really interesting, isn't it? You know, like uh, uh, so much talk about during the week, which way we're going to go. And I, I do like, and I take your points on board, Ed. Um, you know, if it wasn't uh, in the, in the mapped out kind of plans early days, you know, things have kind of chopped and changed obviously a little bit. Hey, listen, what else have we got around the country on the weekend? I'll come back to you, Ed. So what are you thinking, mate, leading us into something? Yeah, I'm going with, I don't, I don't know why I love this horse so much, but I do. Uh, race six, I'm going with uh, Spacewalk at Caulfield. I love everything about Spacewalk. And uh, Jamie Carr takes a ride with 53 uh, yep. kilos. I like this horse fresh. The trials have been good, so I think it can go well. And then at Ascot, we're going to try again in early. Race two, Thomas Magnum. Uh, they're dropping back from 1,200 to 1,000. They get barrier one, some gear changes. I think they'll be nice and close, and I expect this horse to flash home late. Beautifully done. Shano, what about you, buddy? Yeah, I'm playing Caulfield, uh, race seven, the Tristark. Um, I'm very keen on Skewith, the group one winning mare from New Zealand, over Boston in the saddle. Uh, she's around the $5.50 mark. I think that's a really good bet. I just, yeah, her performance when winning the group one last start um, in New Zealand was super strong and she just maps superbly. So I'm really keen on her, Skewith, and the Tristark. And the Moongar race number eight, 
Uh, number 11, Climbing Star. I think we're going to get around that sort of $7, $7.50 mark. Uh, horror watch from the Blazer last start. She had absolutely no luck at all. I think if she got out, she probably uh, goes close to winning the race. She's drawn very well again in gate number four. Craig Williams in the saddle. And I think uh, Climbing Star is very, very dangerous in that race for Philip Stokes. So the Tristark skew with the Moongar Climbing Star. Yeah, looking forward to a big weekend. I uh, love it. It's going to be an absolute cracker. Uh, Maddie's must have for this week. I'm actually going to the Thousand Guineas, boys. Uh, a horse down the bottom, number 14, Moesha, from the Peter Moody, uh, Catherine Coleman Yard. Uh, saw this horse win at uh, Hamilton. He gave a really good push that day, Moods. And uh, go and watch the replay last start at uh, Sandown. Absolutely climbing over the back of them at about 10 bucks. Billy Egan uh, stays in the, uh, the saddle, and I reckon it's not an overly... Overly strong, a uh, thousand guineas for mine, and I reckon that uh, Moesh is a horse on the up that uh, is certainly going to relish the sixteen hundred meters. So uh, that is the go uh, there, and I uh, wish the last salutes last week for Simon Wild in the Group Three um, as well too. So well done to Simon. There, Simon's knocking on the door too to uh, to win his first Group One. So hopefully uh, not too far away, which would be a great story as well. Hey, listen, download that Palmer Bed app too, boys. Uh, really simple, great app to navigate. As we always say, gamble and do it in a responsible manner and always think about what you're really gambling with. Boys, it's been an absolute pleasure, as always. Tipping machines, you two, seriously. I don't know how you do it. Uh, you certainly are very, very good at it. And uh, you, the, the Palmer Bed Bolton in followers are absolutely loving it thus far this spring. So fingers crossed we can keep it going this weekend. Looking forward to it. Should be another good day. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully the gods and the stars align and everything else that uh, helps us uh, come out on top. So I'm looking forward to a big weekend. Uh, good on you. Great stuff, boys. Caulfield Cup weekend this weekend. We'll see you next week. Good luck, legends. See you guys. Imagine what you could be buying instead. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.